bucks for uh, if you have the youngsters. So I would encourage you to uh, think about uh, taking advantage of that. A uh, membership still does have its benefits, uh, the helpfulness of these programs, um, helping pay for the barbecue, which is a member's uh, program in August this year. The date was I don't know, August 4th or something like that, but it was up on the screen up here. I think it's uh, Saturday, Brent, is that Saturday evening, the 4th? Uh, third. Third? There. It was up here on the screen, so I'm sure I'm going to head back to so you've seen it all, right? Uh, and uh, the, um, let's see, uh, there's some great program coming up. Take a look at the materials on the table outside, or look on our website. And if you choose not to be a member, but still would like to receive the uh, newsletter that comes digitally, the email, just give us your name and email address on the piece of paper out front out here. So without further ado, uh, unless I'm missing something, I'm going to turn the floor over to my hand in here with my chair and do our speaker time. Oh, wait. I'm going to let John Sharsman have 30 seconds to talk about a neat place that he's found. 30 seconds, John. Okay, John says I get 30 seconds, so 29 seconds. Let him put his showers. All right, so while I was on my trip, uh, I found these brochures. Uh, they have half day, one day, three, two, three, and four day expeditions to go dig up dinosaur fossils. So if you like one of these flyers, you're welcome to it. Uh, it just let me know after the program. Where? Did I make it? Where? Oh, Grand Junction, Colorado. I have my own mic. You give that to John. So let, let's get started with the program. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend, uh, Dr. Liz King. Liz is a geology major at Carleton in Carleton College in Minnesota, mineralogy and petrology, the study of formation of rocks, were the most difficult classes she took. So, of course, she decided she needed to spend her career studying. Uh, her undergraduate thesis was on granitic rocks on Mount Desert Island, Maine. Some of you have been there. And uh, that's where her long grant began. Her master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison where she moved to stabilize into geochemistry and granitic rocks. She's worked on rocks, granites from the Basin Range, the Idaho Batholith, and the Superior Province of Canada. Uh, Liz spent eight years being a professor at the, on the faculty of Illinois State University. She got tenure and promptly quit to move here. Uh, good choice, Liz. She's currently the only coordinator for the Teton Literacy Center and an adjunct professor, a new job, at the Community College of Fresno. As well, she's raising three athletic young men. We may see two of them tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Liz King. Isotopes just to kind of get them on the same page and also a little bit about zircons and then also we lump them all together to show how poor they are for interpreting the early standard of our planet's formation. Um, I certainly need to thank the flag readings I have on this uh, on all this research and when I started this program afterwards um, in the 90s, it was a pretty small group of folks who were working on zircons and oxygen isotopes. The list has gotten much longer through the years. Um, most importantly, I need to thank Don Alley, who's my PhD advisor, um, and some of these are my co-authors and other folks who have gotten stuck in the budget for the as well. Uh, some of the labs that we're going to visit the data from, this is on the top, is actually the Oxygen Isotope Lab in Madison, um, Wisconsin, and then in the middle is Edinburgh, Scotland, and down at the bottom is Australia. So we're going to be doing a global tour of labs to piece all the journeys here together as well. Okay, so geologic history is uh, very difficult to grasp. Some of the ages of things in geologic history, 
Um, you know, so we think it's human, things that are old for us, it might be a few hundred years, maybe a few thousand years, that seems like a long time ago. This line here is all geologic time uh, to scale. So you can see humans coming in at the very far right down here about zero. 4.56, that is the formation of our planet. Um, obviously not all the events are shown on here, but to give you an idea, the age of dinosaurs by this length of white line right here, when I say 65 million years ago, seems like a really long time ago. Um, but you can see how much more geologic time there is farther back beyond the dinosaurs. Um, and then at 500 million years, and before that, we get the first animals with hard shells, and you still have 4 billion years worth of Earth's history that we need to be worried about. So, um, you know, again, what we do get about in terms of life and our modern Earth is very, very short term compared to the rest of geologic history. So, we have billions of years of not a lot going on besides single cell uh, organisms, and up until 2000, so 18 years ago, the oldest piece of our Earth's history is this Castor Rock uh, nice up in northern Canada. That's actually a piece of rock you can go on the Pygmy Mountains, 4.04 billion years old. Um, and so, until let's talk about this in this presentation, that's the oldest thing we have on our planet. Yeah. Um, this is a new system. Yeah. And so, that was the first time we've used this sound. And uh, there appears to be no way to adjust the volume. Um, brand new projectors uh, and screens are nice and bright, but this is not coming through very well. Okay, let me use that. So I don't try this. Try this. Yeah. And yeah. either works. Yeah. Much much if okay. either works, just try it with uh, <laughs> a shout. Okay. Let's we'll see. So, let, so this is, sorry, this, this is the first time this was used was Tuesday last week. You know, we're probably about the second or third that's used it, so we're still learning how to use the system. There just aren't separate controls for the volume like the old system. Okay, so we'll give this a shot and see if it's pretty so we'll to it. Um, Okay, so the oldest rocks that we have, the oldest thing you can stand on is 4 billion years old, still 500 million years of Earth's history that we had no record for until recently. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but what happened in the most recent 500 million years? Well, you know, pretty much all life as we know it has kind of appeared on the scene. So that's a lot of geologic time that we knew nothing about. Um, so we're going to delve into this realm back here, so you can see the oldest earth on crystal is 4.4 billion years. So we filled in a few of the gaps back here, not a ton, um, but we're getting there. So until these zircons came about and were discovered um, around 2000, this is what early Earth was thought to look like. Um, this was actually in the cover of Life magazine. So this would be early Earth, um, very tenacious, magma oceans, asteroid compartments, not a place you want to spend a lot of time. But it was thought that for you know, many hundreds of millions of years, this is what our planet looked like um, very early on. Hopefully by the end of this talk, I will convince you that this is probably a more realistic picture of what Earth looked like now, in the early stages of our formation. Uh, in that we still have lots of volcanoes, there are probably still a lot of fast broken markets, that's not the issue. But what you notice now is we don't have magma oceans, but we don't have water oceans. Um, so these few zircon grains have greatly changed what our Earth's early history um, likely was like. Alright, so a little bit on geologic history now. Why oxygen? Well, it's a major element and it's in most minerals. Almost half of the Earth's crust is made of oxygen. So it's, um, for the most part, pretty easy to analyze. We're not talking about parts per million here, it's weight percent. Um, so the lab that you would analyze oxygen in does not have to be a clean lab. You I mean, could sit there eating your lunch next to it while we're analyzing. You don't have to get the booties and suits and all that kind of stuff. So oxygen is a very easy element to be working with. Um, there are three stable isotopes of oxygen. Now, stable isotopes are important. Most people think of isotopes in geology, uranium lead, and radioactive decay. But there are stable isotopes. Their relative abundances do not change through time. Um, and so, oxygen has three stable isotopes. Really, the only difference is the number of neutrons um, in the nucleus of the atom. So, there's oxygen 16, 17, and 18. Oxygen-16 makes up 99.8% of all the oxygen that there is in the world. 
oxygen 17 is um, the least abundant, and oxygen 18 uh, is the middle abundance there. So when we analyze oxygen isotope ratios, we're actually analyzing oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Um, not only because it's not very abundant, oxygen 17 is very difficult to analyze, uh, but it turns out it's really only interesting if you're dealing with lunar samples, uh, Martian samples, and non-terrestrial samples. So oxygen 17 kind of gets ignored for the most part. Um, okay, so oxygen isotope ratio, what they record, they're stable, so they're not decaying through time. So what they represent, these different ratios, is the temperature history in the rock. Uh, and so this can be a very important story if you want to try to interpret what your rock is seeing and what it's undergone, uh, it's, it's temperature history, also what melted to make your rock, uh, another part that oxygen isotopes can help you with. And the notation here you're going to see for this is over here it's delta O18. So this built into this is actually a formula that ratios oxygen 16 and 18 in your sample relative to seawater. So we don't need to worry about that formula, but just know you can see this delta O18 notation. And uh, the units on it are per mil, so the extra zero there uh, is per mil compared to percent. So percent is in 100, mil is in 1,000. Um, so you're going to see these on the, the data. Um, so temperature history, give you know, a brief, very simplistic outline of how temperatures can affect oxygen isotope ratios. If you have a body of water here, it doesn't matter if it's an ocean or a lake, but if you have evaporation going on, which happens, um, the oxygen will evaporate preferentially, or different isotopes evaporate preferentially. It all has to do with bond energy, which bonds are easier to break, which ones are you know, more stable. And uh, so it turns out if you're evaporating water, the clouds end up being enriched in oxygen 16, because those bonds are easier to break and evaporate into your cloud. So the body of water that's left behind is relatively heavier, or has more oxygen 18 in it. If you kind of follow the water cycle cruise and go through and start making your precipitation, you still do have some oxygen 18 in the cloud. Uh, it's not just 16, it's just it likes to have 16 in the cloud. But when you actually start making your precipitation, rain or snow, the 18, oxygen 18 unit will preferentially go into what is coming out of the cloud. Uh, so you can see this, you know, all these different processes through just the water cycle. Uh, are going to be what change where you're 16 and 18 in oxygen in your city. <clears throat> and we'll come back to that in a little bit as well as we start applying this to rocks. Um, so why is Rukon? Here's the mineral formula up top. Well, it has a lot of oxygen in there. It has four oxygens. Um, here's the mineral structure of Zircon as well. It's a common mineral. I put common in parentheses um, because it doesn't mean it's abundant uh, by any means. Um, and so when I was out sampling my granites, I would collect 50 pounds of granite, bring it back to the lab, and I would cross my fingers to get 5 milligrams of zircon out of that 50 pounds. Um, you know, so that's a few hundred grains. So you know, they're thinking common means that it's, you know, it's out there in great abundance. Uh, the other nice thing about zircon is refractory and soluble. What this means, once you make a zircon, it's really hard to destroy it in whatever of the rock cycle it's going through. It's, if it gets remelted, or if you, the zircon the rock is sitting in gets remelted, that zircon really isn't going kind to of melt. It's kind of like a vault of information. And so once it grows, a lot of that information is just locked in there. Um, and so it can be a very complicated story, but it doesn't lose any part of that story uh, since its formation. So that's a good thing. And how do we extract oxygen from zircon? Well, again, I've gone out in the field, got my 50 pounds of granite, granite into sand, hope to end up with 5 milligrams of zircon. And if you go into the lab, and the reason that I have 5 milligrams means that I can actually do analyses on it. And I really only need about 2 milligrams of sample. So this is a little sample plug down here. Each of those little holes in there is a few millimeters across, and so that is 2 milligrams of mineral sample that's sitting down in that hole. Where this sample chamber then lives is kind of right about here. It's the lab in Madison again. So this little plug is sitting down here, and um, looking using the camera to look in the television there, he is uh, extracting oxygen from zircons or any mineral that happens to be in there. So how we do that? 
Well, luckily, fluoride is a very reactive gas. So we use burning kind of fluoride, put it into the chamber with the minerals, and then we have to use a laser, which will heat up the mineral and swap out any of the oxygen in your stuff and release with fluoride. So this, uh, we ended up with oxygen gas coming out of our zircons. We cleaned it up, moving down this line here, and then this mass spectrometer that we can analyze the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16. So again, this is a super uh, not clean lab. Like the door is open in the hallway, oxygen is a major element, and uh, it's, it's pretty easy to extract compared to some of the other elements that folks analyze in the mills. Uh, okay, another point for why is there a Zircon allows, when it's crystallizing, allows uranium in the crystal structure. So again, going back to um, unstable isotopes or radioactive isotopes, uranium will decay the lead, which um, many of you may be familiar with from using to date samples. So zircon uh, initially was you know, came out through using uranium lead dating techniques, the life crystallized with uranium in there. Um, and then slow oxygen diffusion. So these numbers are not going to mean a whole lot to, to those who don't live, breathe, and die in oxygen diffusion. But samples exchange oxygen with the neighbor all the time. And so you want something, again, the zircon and the vault, you want it to form and not exchange oxygen with the neighbor at any point during its history. So looking at diffusion rates of minerals, we're not going to get bogged down in the details here. What you need to know is that if you're on the this quarter of things, you're a fast diffuser. So alabite, anorthite, these are your Feldsberg minerals. We used to joke that you basically put sneeze on them and they'll exchange your oxygen. So they're not refractory. You're not going to hold on to that oxygen from when they first formed. Biotite kind of the same way up here on the fast side of the diagram. Biotite really is not a very good retainer of oxygen from when it first formed. This may be a good thing. This may be part of the story that you're going after, the alteration history. But if you want to see through all that and want to see what your original magma was like and your original rock was like, you want to slow the user. And these are what lived down on this side of the graph. So uh, zircon, maybe you can see that's, that's slow. Garnet also slow. So once these minerals form, uh, they're igneous or metamorphic minerals, that oxygen is locked in there. It's not going to exchange with its neighbor, which is good if that's part of the story you're going after. Okay, so let's look at some delta 18 values of, of minerals and rocks and trying to establish some reservoirs and think of a baseline before we go back in time. So, this is an analysis of samples from the mantle. Uh, and the mantle is a huge part of our planet, so a big reservoir that we're dealing with. So, these top two histograms are all of these analyses. This, this middle one here is uh, from Hawaii, from Arlo and Luigi. And then these are analyses from mantle prototypes, so samples of the mantle brought up to the surface. And again, this is just kind of going at establishing reservoirs and baselines and what it all means. And it looks like, and again, this mantle is very homogeneous. So from these all of samples, 5.2 per mil is kind of the, what we're looking at for values. Down at the bottom are um, analysis of zircons from Kimberlites in South Africa. Again, thought to be samples from the mantle are pretty darn close to it. And you can see the delta 18 values in these are 5.3. So, you know, not that far off. So we're talking about mantle, the number to kind of keep in mind, 5.2, 5.3 is the uh, delta 18 of the mantle. Things are more interesting when you get up into the crust. So this plot here, we got delta 18 in the bottom. Here is zero. And there is seawater up there at zero per mil. So since this is a ratio of whatever your sample is to seawater, seawater is zero per mil. This red line here is mantle. So just, just a little bit shy of the five per mil line down the bottom. So this is sort of a stratigraphic column in a way, but this, this top section here is ocean crust. I'm looking what happens. If you look down at the bottom part of the ocean crust, these fresh basalts, they're about mantle values, which makes sense. Um, if you start altering them at lower temperatures, they get a little bit higher in delta 18, and then all these sedimentary rocks get higher and higher in delta 18. So what we can take away from this is that mantle is five and a half per mil, or 5.3-ish. Sedimentary rocks have higher delta 18 values than that, which means they've interacted at low temperature in water and the surface of the earth. 
So if you add you know, any crustal component into a mantle sample, it's going to trend up this way towards a higher delta OET. Continent segments also show the same um, idea as the answer the shales, limestones, with higher delta OET values, you know, up to 30 per mil on some of these limestones. So again, if you add any crustal component, these formed at low temperature surface of the earth, uh, to a mantle value, you're going to drag things up towards higher delta OET. Uh, and then down in these granites down here, um, these are zircon samples, so I type granites, so pretty classic igneous granites, near mantle values. And these ST granites, they're called that because they have a sedimentary component, which is seen in the mineralogy of them, and also seen in the delta OIT. Yeah, so we're never going to really get extreme 30 and 40 per mil igneous delta OIT values, but you know, in the igneous world, to get 10 per mil um, is, is a significant uh, increase from your mantle value. So again, it's time five and a half per mil on your mantle, and anything higher means it's got to interact with something that formed at low temperature with surface uh, with water at the surface. Okay, for Cambridge history, another geologic timeline here for you. Uh, this one's not quite to scale at all. So here's the pre Cambrian down here. This, uh, the, the boundary between the green and the purple is 545 million years ago, so we're right around that first timeline. This is where the animals with hard hearts come in, right here. And we're going to condense the next 4 billion years of time down into this part. Um, so a lot of the samples that I worked on are Archean in age, so about 2.5 to 2.7 billion years. And then we're going to work back uh, towards what's called the Hadean uh, time, and where things get you know, murkier and less known uh, for older than 4 billion years. Okay, so the samples that we're going to have coming from these Precambrian rocks come from the Precambrian shields, and these are this is Precambrian rock that was exposed to the surface of the earth. So anything in red here is rock that you actually can walk up to and sit on if you want. So the Canadian shield is um, certainly one of the nearest largest exposures of Precambrian rock. Uh, you can see you know, some of the red and the rocky mountains over here, um, but there are some exposed Precambrian rocks in South America and Africa. And what's in green just means that there is Precambrian rock at depth. It's been covered with sedimentary rock. So, you know, if you drive to central Wyoming, uh, there is Precambrian rock way down, it's just been covered over by the rocks. So, you know, it's easier if the rocks are exposed to the surface, like in the Canadian Shield. So, some of the names you're going to see in these plots, the Superior Province is where it's part of the Canadian Shield up here. Um, the Slave Province up in northern Canada also appears in some of the data. The Barberton uh, region down in South Africa, and then we eventually get to the Jack Hills in Australia, where the oldest serpents have been coming from. Okay, so a look at the superior province. Uh, this is a lot of the work from my, my master was when serpents were really first starting to be studied in terms of oxygen isotopes. And the nice thing about the superior province is it's, it's old, it's 2.7 billion years old, most us. But it's really well understood tectonically. There's a lot of evidence from a lot of different avenues of geology to understand how the superior province formed, which is good because you don't want to get some delta 18 numbers of rocks you don't really understand because what does it mean? You, know, you want to start with reservoirs and, and environments that you can get and move back through time to things that you understand uh, or have less details on. Um, so, superior province you can see is these linear belts of what are called granite greenstone belts. And think of these as arcs like Japan, the Philippines, that obviously have been you know, combined together. But each of these belts would be a volcanic arc. And then in the yellow, we have kind of sedimentary belts. And so these are going to be where the sediments were uh, shed off of volcanic belts uh, as they were forming. Uh, and then some of the names we're going to see as I just go through a quick tectonic model here are um, the Wapagoon, English River, Uchi, and the Barents, so just, you know, just kind of get located where we are in Superior Province in this next slide right here. Okay, so here's the Barents River. I just mentioned that name. So this is kind of up in the north. Here's the Uchi Belt. This is, again, just think of a volcanic arc like Japan. It's being subducted towards this chunk of land up here. English River Belt, these are the dead sediments. So this is just eroding off of the Uchi Belt. And these are all the subduction zones. So all the stuff is moving in this diagram from left to right and will eventually get added on to this body of land up here. And so down in the bottom, you can see here's our Barrens River, but now we've attached 
Gucci belts, English River, whatever they were required to. So you kind of get the idea. We have this alternating volcanic belts, sedimentary belts, volcanic belts, sedimentary belts. And it's very well agreed upon that even though they're two and a half, two point seven billion years old, that subduction is what is causing this accretion of this land mass through time. So this is this is good that we understand how they're forming. So Zircon analyses from the Superior Province. Uh, here's a history of all of the analyses that I did for my masters, and overall, the Superior Province is 5.6 per mil in terms of zircons. So hopefully, uh, you're like, oh, that's very close to the mantle. Yes, it is very close to the mantle. So things back in the Archean when Superior Province were forming, these rocks were, you know, not coming straight out of the mantle, but pretty mantle-like uh, in terms of the source of what was making the rocks. And the next sedimentary province, Plutons, again, the word sediment in there, hopefully you're like, oh, right, that means a higher delta to my team. So, yes, these are sitting on the higher end of the histogram, nothing crazy, no great mills, but they're, you know, statistically higher in delta to my team than the stereotypical igneous rock in the superior province there. So, overall, pretty mantle like, but, you know, kind of trending the way that we want things to go of add some sediment into your magma and you're going to increase your delta to my team. And you know, if you really want to get picky, if you look at these delta 18 values versus SAO2 content, it's kind of weird, but kind of nice that um, the, the delta 18 is really homogeneous, no matter what the SAO2 content is that we take these rocks. So uh, you know, it's just it's all mantle kind of all the time back in the Archean. So the Archean subduction zone is really not drastically different from what the modern subduction zone might look like. But here's your ocean crust going down underneath uh, the overlying continental crust. So there's your mantle, with about 5.5, 10.3 per mil. Your continental crust will have slightly higher delta 18 values because there are sedimentary rocks in there. And extend, so here are your sediments, you know, about 10 to 11 per mil. So, uh, you know, this is kind of the, you, you look at this and try to figure out, you know, how much sediment I've got to extend in my mantle, and I look at the delta 18 value that I have. Um, but again, nothing, nothing super extreme and high back in the Archean. So here's a lot of delta 18 uh, values for zircon versus age. So this is all Precambrian uh, ages here. So here's the superior province, amazingly well clustered in their 2.5, 2.7 billion years in age. And uh, again, this green line that goes across the middle is the mantle zircon value. So you can see mantle-ish, nothing super extreme. Um, we're not going to deal with Granville much younger, but you can see things get um, a little more interesting in Granville as we get there. Um, we're going to go back to time in the Barberton, but this is in South Africa. It's very similar to the Superior Province. The Barberton is slightly less well observed, so it's, it's less easy to construct kind of the tectonic environment of the Barberton, but it's nice that the delta and values in these Rikons are very similar. So we're looking at Mansell, a little sediment in there, but nothing too extreme. Again, these higher values will be you know, where your sediment that, is, that uh, exchange with water and the temperature gets added in. And then now we're going to, so the oldest, you know, true rocks that we have in this plot are from the Barberton that are get, uh, about 3.5 billion years of age. So now we need to go back a little bit farther in time to the Jack Hills in Australia, which is where these older uh, zircons come from from the, the Hayden time. So just a quick look at the Jack Hills. So Western Australia, there's Perth down here for uh, reference. The Jack Hills are up here. And uh, again, we don't have granites, original granite outcrops to go sit on. These are uh, sedimentary, metasedimentary rocks. So here's an outcrop over here. This is you know, the outcrop where these are mine came from. And it's a sedimentary rock. So you've got to imagine that the original granite isn't there anymore. It's upstream somewhere. It's been broken away and moved downstream and deposited into this sedimentary rock and conglomerate outcrop, from which we get zircons. And these are much younger zircons that look way better than those. But this is an example that we're extracting zircons out of this outcrop. So a geologic map of the Jack Hills region. It's a little bit of everything, but mostly uh, these uh, sedimentary rocks here in this cross-hedge pattern. There's some band and iron formations all the great rocks, and there are some, some grants that are still existing, but they're much younger than the zircons we're going after. Um, and this is you know, a little view of what it's like there in Western Australia, looking for your, your outcrop. 
So again, here is E out and off that E holds the Zircon came from. So again, there are 72 rocks that formed 3.3 to 3.7 billion years ago. Now the minerals in them clearly are older because they weathered up something upstream um, that formed you know, a billion years before this. Um, <clears throat> so from that outcrop, they, uh, the zircons are extracted. Now again, remember if I was driving up to somewhere in Idaho and trying to get zircons out of something, I would get 50 pounds of rock to go back to this and I'm throwing in my cheek and trying to buy milligrams of zircon out of it. Well, this is a very complicated now sedimentary rock. You know, if you take 50 pounds of this, it's not like the original zircon. It's a, it's a hodgepodge of stuff in there. So when we start looking at these oldest minerals, this is where we go from bulk analyses of hundreds of grains to actually just analyzing a single grain. Because it gets very complicated. This is a mix of a billion years worth of minerals in here. Your handle has that and two milligrams, who knows what it means. So you've got to be looking at individual grains trying to figure out every little piece of this out crop. So this is an image of the world's oldest zircon right here, uh, and two different versions of it, one's just false color. Uh, and so these are kind of separated from the quartzite within that outcrop. And to give you an idea of scale, so here's 50 microns. So the grain is maybe 150 microns across, which is a fraction of a fraction of the human hair. Uh, so very, very tiny. I mean, it's incredibly fortuitous that the grain was found. And uh, as we'll build up through here, but uh, this is the part of the zircon where they got the 4.4 billion year old age on it. Um, so again, these are single grades that we're going to be analyzing. Now, they're very precious samples. So to give you an idea of what that individual grain underwent while I was being studied, and still being studied, actually. So different imaging that we've already seen two examples of. We'll talk about how we got uh, underlying heat rating like age dating, then the oxygen isotope data, and then all this other uh, research that's been done on this too. This one single grain that's 150 microns across, as well as, as all of its buddies that got pulled out of the outcrop too. Um, so here's that same grain, and uh, different backscattered electron image on the left, and these, you can see the little pits in the surface, would be where the ion beams were to analyze the grain light age dating on it. So again, this grain, it still exists, it has never been completely destroyed in any of these tests. Um, so part of what needed to happen when we study this is to have technology catch up to study such tiny little um, samples and not destroy them. Another way of imaging the zircon, you can see that this is the zircon core. And, you know, so we're gonna talk about how these form like um, vaults in terms of what information happens to them. So this, this core would have formed first, and then you can see there's growth expanding on the outside. So kind of like tree grains. So there's maybe another growth event in zircon and starts adding on the layers of zircon. So even one grain, it's very complex for what happened in here. Um, but that's why really part of the reason why there's so many places that they did these ion beam tips to try and study um, the age and the oxygen on it. Uh, okay, so back in Australia, not in, not up in the Jack Hills, but uh, this is where the, the uranium light age dating comes in. So SHRIMP stands for High Resolution Ion Medical Probe um, Geochronology. And uh, so the, the Aussies were the ones to first really have a machine to analyze single grains for their uranium lead ages. And really not going to get dogged down in the details of this graph here, but this is the plot that comes out from the shrimp machine and lots of data massaging to try and figure out how old your sample is. So what you need to know is this line here, these little tip marks, those are billions of years. Uh, I guess millions of years, but 3.2 billion, 3.4, going all the way back to 4.4 billion years back here. The other key thing on this plot is that you are really happy if not only you have the real age, but if it's sit on this line that the little tip marks are on. Your data kind of screams out here, well, your sample's got some issues going on, and the, the age may be okay, but it's not as clear cut. If your age is sitting right on this line, it's easy, and no one's gonna argue about it. So any of these ages on this line um, are really, really um, good ages to get. So you can see that a lot, 37 grades are analyzed, and they're much younger, about 3.5 billion years. 
there are a couple grains that are at 4 billion years, and then that one single grain at 4.4 billion years, thankfully, sitting right in the line behaving well, not one of these down here that has to be explained and extrapolated back. So, um, kind of an idea of how this was studied. This is thrown on grain, this mounted in epoxy. This is surface one. So again, there are those iron chrome tips, and you can see the ages that they got, and those are pretty good. I mean, at that point, there was the oldest grains, the oldest ages that they got as well as 4.3 billion years. So here is that zircon core that we saw before as well. And this part in gray in surface right now is underneath the epoxy. So this grain was mounted up because anything in blue or pink was at the surface and able to be analyzed for uranium like ages. And then they actually just studied some more. Um, the grain's not totally destroyed, but they polished it down to surface two. And so thankfully, you can still see the zircon core here. Thankfully, surface two is where that 4.4 million year old age um, comes in. And so again, that's up to right here, sitting right on that line and behaving well. Um, so they did do two different surfaces to kind of get deeper into the zircon and see how the internet change. Now, in between that, surface one, we're analyzed in Australia for uranium land ages. Then at Bond went to Edinburgh to be studied for oxygen isotopes. The board went back to Australia to be dated in surface two. So this world of grain has traveled a little many times. Um, but on surface one, in this zircon core, is where the delta 18 to 7.4 per mil was found. And so the outside, five per mil, hopefully you're now saying, oh, it's going to be nice and light and not super exciting. But the core of it, 7.4 mil. So there is something in the original magma that made the zircon 4.4 billion years ago that had a you know, kind of sedimentary, high delta routine, altered at uh, um, low temperatures with water component in it to be able to elevate that delta routine up to 7.4. Um, and then, so again, after these, uh, these were analyzed, got sent back to Australia, and then redid it. So the puzzle pieces are kind of coming together. We know it's super old, and now uh, the oxygen uh, came in between uh, those rounds of uranium light dates. Uh, another piece of evidence that's used to uh, prove that the zircon green and you know, kind of where it came from, because we have no context for this single grain, the original health map is in the mound, is within that green, as we're growing, it's a little bit of quartz. And Quartz is most common in granites and crustal rocks, you know, not in mantle rocks. So, you know, a lot of this uh, evidence is pointing to that this grain forms, you know, from a granite that something on the surface melted um, to, to create. <clears throat> so, just to kind of summarize what this little grain has shown us so far is, you know, we've got these old uh, uranium light ages from 4 to 4.4. The oxygen isotopes look like there's a signature of low temperature interaction with the surface of the Earth with that seven per mil uh, point that's on there. And then the mineral inclusions indicate that it came from a, a, a granite. So it's the original outcrop would have been granite somewhere upstream that over a billion years was eroded, deposited into this metal conglomerate that we now see in the Jack Hills. Um, and again, some of the other tests on there, the trace elements, help show that it comes from a continental rock um, rather than straight out of the mantle. Uh, so again, just kind of summarizing over here, there's the mantle in green, the spread in the Jack Hills, zircon data, um, but here is where the oldest one, the 4.4 billion year old zircon sits in terms of um, all the data that we have from the little oxygenized strips from there. Okay, so again, going back to our timeline here, this is only um, 3.7 billion years, so the first billion years of our planet. Uh, so the oldest sediments that we know of in Greenland are about 3.8, the oldest rocks of the Canada, 4 billion, you know, up until 18 years ago, this is what we had. And so we knew kind of how things had to happen from our formation, but, you know, it's, that's 400 million years of, of time that you're, you know, sort, sort of making up the steps, the building the blanks, and the grades, how things have to happen, we have absolutely no data from 4.6 up until 4 million years ago. So these all those zircons nicely fill in this time here, 4.4 to 4 billion years, and uh, indicate that at 4.4 billion years when the zircon originally crystallized, we had low temperature water on the surface of our Earth because of that high 7 per mil delta 18 value on there. 
Um, so also in here, you know, we have formation of the moon, formation of our core, you know, so things, things get really pushed back in terms of how fast things form on our planet, all because of these old circons that got found in Australia. You know, before we had, uh, you know, up until four billion years of uh, uh, time for all this to happen, didn't really know how it happened, but you know, it's the best we could do to, the story that we, to, to make the story that we have with the data we have. But now we show that within 200 million years of our planet forming, we um, had to undergo the formation of our moon, we had to differentiate our core, and we had to cool off enough to have liquid water on the surface of our Earth. So you know, this has definitely changed textbooks and a lot of models for how quickly things form and, and uh, cool off on the surface of our planet. Um, so again, a different way of looking at things. This is our, the ages of zircons versus the delta 18 of zircons. And you know, here's the mantle right here. So this is all the superior province data that we talked about before. This is going to be Barbara Tune and Jack Hills. So it's pretty mantle-like, but luckily um, it's showing that what's available here is super crusted zircon, but with this superficial or temperature input into the zircon formation. And so again, luckily nothing is really out of the range of the superior problems. We understand these rocks and how they form. So when we go back and find a seven mil sample at four billion years, we can then understand what happened to make that delta 18 in that sample as well. You know, luckily it doesn't get super weird back here because we would have no context for how to interpret it. Um, and then just to show you, I did mention we're reviewing 4.4 billion years of time in zircon, but I just didn't put this plot up here to show you that the Archean is well understood and thankfully pretty normal. Once you get out of the Archean, uh, things get really crazy. You know, not, nothing like 30 per mil, but there are some, you know, 10, 11 per mil zircons up here. There are some 2 per mil ones, so things get really crazy. And so thankfully, as we went back in time, things didn't kind of don't diverge back that direction. We we're pretty well constrained for you know, two billion years of time, how things are forming um, in the Archean. So again, early Earth, probably not, as we found from these zircons uh, in Western Australia. And instead, this is the picture that we're going with for what early Earth would look like in the early space of Earth. So liquid water oceans, you know, kind of a play on the, the magma oceans there, the key difference here, liquid water still undergoing bombardment, uh, and things are still really quite hot and volcanic. But we would have had to cool off quite quickly to get the water in the surface for early. Uh, so, we're yeah, in there for any questions. Mm -hmm. Have the lunar zircon shown any indication of what happened prior to, uh, given any indication for a couple hundred million years? No, they have not. The question was if the lunar zircon is helpful in Earth's first time. No, they, they have not. I think uh, things got so, you know, so the moon presumably got knocked off of Earth. And so during that process, uh, and the big melting of it all, there's a very few samples not be able to fill in the blanks of our planets before the moon got knocked off. Can you your diagrams where you had the red was? Cambrian exposed. Mm -hmm. Scandinavia looked like it was huge. Have you found the one that saw Finland on this last diagram? Yes. Um, How old are those? Let's see, go back to this plot here. So there are some Finland samples, and those would be uh, photo results of one and a half to two billion years for where those samples are being analyzed. So nothing as old as um, this period of long as much earlier. Yeah. So I'd like to correct the your Western Australian sample had one zircon, correct? It's found one. There were many zircons that were analyzed, so um, many of these over are from Western Australia, um, but there's just one that had an old date in it. And those were you know, found and analyzed in 2000-2001. Has anyone been back? to try and find more, oh, and really? find some old ones. <laughs> I'm always but looking. That further, there's a good chance to absorb they, they may be the option. Right. Uh, yes, there were definitely many more uh, sampling taken, and not even as old as that, that one point four. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> You're not really thinking that. <laughs> yes. 
Just as a test, Liz, yeah. try, try keep that further away from your, further away, yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what works, what's okay. clear. Also, did you turn off the, I did turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. The term, the uh, Yeah. 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 Following on that, how do you extract, extract the oxygen samples and differentiate the two isotopes? Uh, so the two isotopes, when you extract oxygen from your zircon and the laser to heat it up and get the oxygen out of there, okay. you actually convert it into the CO2, and then uh, you put it down a mass spectrometer with a magnet. So the, the lighter isotope will bend more than the heavier isotope, and you can add any count on the other end of that magnet to flight to. So the spectrometer is sensitive enough to differentiate between those two. It is, yes. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, one of your slides, you talked about Mars rocks. Has there been research on Martian? Uh, there, have, there have been some Martian samples. It's far as I know, Martian zircon. So some Martian meteorites, for sure, I have been studying. Um, and so they're, they're not zircon models out of there, as far as I know. You're probably familiar with Ron and Pamela Frost and, mm -hmm. and their Web Canyon rocks with Zircon in them. How do they fit into that? Um, I forget, were they 3.7 million years? Or? I don't know how old those are. Do you know how old those old Web Canyon Zircons are? Are they that old? Are they? I think the they're like 2.6 or so. Okay. I think the old Zircons were really years He's got some over three, I know. And I think that might have been from Granite Hills, actually. The oldest zircons that you were talking about, what Rod Frost has found, and Carol Frost. Yeah. I think um, that the oldest zircons in Wyoming they found are actually from the Granite Hills. Um, so more over in central Wyoming. And Ron is uh, insistent that he's going to find the oldest um, um, Zircon on Earth from the Granite Hills, but we'll see. <laughs> the race <laughs> on. Any questions? Yeah. Where do they keep this zircon? Where do they keep this one? Where do they keep this one? Where do they keep this one? Yeah, I have drug custody on the order. I've actually been sitting around. I have seen it. It wasn't allowed briefly when I was there. Um, I don't know where it resides permanently. I mean, I'm not allowed to know. It's a real treasure. Right? No, it is. For sure. <laughs> say, say, um, looking at that uh, most ancient zircon, what would you comment on about how it grew given that? What you identify as the core is not the oldest part of it. Yes, so it's um, zircons. Okay, you know, I'm thinking it's a more recent example. I mean, I don't know, but uh, some of the zircons there have cores that um, you know kind of grew somewhere else in the time and got picked up from the magma, and then as it continued to cool, the, the the zircon you know kind of pre-existing structure kind of kept growing on there, so they. You know, kind of growing different parts, um, you know, inherited from different parts. Uh, and so the core was the highest delta 18, but the, the oldest age was kind of just outside of that, which, yeah, it's, it's definitely complicated for sure. <laughs> Any other Are there uh, any other questions? I'm just going to do this without the mic. Yeah. It seems like it might be easier. <laughs> uh, so before we. Uh, Liz, on behalf of the geologists of Jackson Hole, we'll just start present for you. Thank you.